Hey guys, welcome to another lesson. So today we're looking at magnets, right? So magnets are a very playful thing that we're used to, right? Which shows that it's just a material that attracts other metallic materials, right? Or it can repel or attract another ma uh, magnet, right? So that's basically what a magnet is at this level. And the, the magnetic field, right? Because if we notice, if we put a magnet, right? We have a magnet here and we have a metal, right? If the metal is too far from the magnet, there is no force being felt, right? But the closer you get, right? You notice there is now an attractive force from the metal by the magnet, right? So because what we're doing is we're actually going inside the magnetic field. And that magnetic field is a region around the magnet where you feel a force, right? So once you're outside that region, there is no force that you'll feel. So the metal will not feel an attractive force being, being made by the magnet. But once it's in the field, right, you'll notice there's an attractive force that's pulling that metal to the magnet. So your metal, your magnetic field is the region around the magnet where the force is being felt, right? Now we have a bar magnet here and we know magnets have a north and a, a south pole, right? So we have a magnet here that has a north and a south pole. Now the, mag the magnetic field lines around the magnet moves from your positive side to your negative side, right? So we notice that there is no field lines on the side of your magnet, right? Because that's where the magnetic field is less. So the force of attraction or the force of the magnet is actually mostly at the ends or the poles of your magnet. So once you have a bar magnet, right? This is a bar magnet. So once you have a bar magnet, the magnetic force is, being, is felt mostly at the poles, at the sides you have less because there's less magnetic field lines on the side, all right? So please note the direction of your arrows. So the direction of the arrows are important. So for the north part, the north pole, the field lines are going out. And for the south pole, the field lines are going in. So that's very important, right? Now, before we move on, let's look at why does your compass points to the north of Earth, right? So let's say that's Earth, right? We know that this is our cardinal north, south, east, and west. And if we have a magnet on Earth, the magnet always points to the north, right? And that point of the magnet is always the north part of that magnet on your compass, right? So why does your magnet seeks to find the north? Now, that's because Earth itself has its own magnetic field, right? So you'll see some diagrams that have Earth and you have some lines going like this around it. Those are the magnetic fields moving from one pole of Earth to the next, right? So because we know that opposite poles will attract each other, if our magnet arrow is a north pole, it will seek to attract the south pole of Earth's magnetic field. So that means Earth's magnetic field is actually the north pole of Earth's magnetic field is on Earth's south, right? So the geographical south of Earth is our north magnetic pole, right? And our south is at the north geographic point, right? So that's why the magnet always points towards north because it's been attracted by the south magnetic field of Earth. All right. So that's what we just talked about, that north and south will have an attractive force. And because it's attractive, the magnetic field lines of both magnets will actually connect with each other. Right. And please note the direction as well. It always moves from north to south. So we just need one arrow on each line to show the direction, right? So we show that it moves from our north. So if we cover south, it shows that it's going away from north. If we cover north, it's going towards south, right? So that shows us the attraction. And then if we have two of the same poles together, then we know we get repulsion, right? And repulsion, basically our field lines coming in, right? So they're 
both going out so they both hit and spread apart right so because they're going the same direction they both hit and spread apart right so we don't there's no interlocking of our free lines now if we notice in the center there is a space right where no free lines are right so that x represents a space which is our neutral point so where there is no field lines, then that's known as our neutral point. And that's point, there is no force of the magnet being felt at that point. And that's our repulsion. And again, pay attention to the direction of your arrows, right? So because it's to the north, all our arrows should be pointing away from the, the magnet poles, right? But what if it was to south? Right? Because... This will give us also repulsion, right? So two south will give us repulsion, and those repulsive forces, right, will give us our arrows to point now going in because our south pole magnetic lines always point inwards. So it's very important to know once it's north, it's pointing outwards. Once it's south, it's pointing inwards towards the magnet right so these are two forces that our magnets experience an attractive force because there is a north and a south pole and a repulsive force because they are two of the same poles together so north and north or south and south right so now let's look at electromagnetism and that's where we have electricity and magnets together right so there is this rule that says, once current is moving in a wire, there is a magnetic field that is being produced around the wire, right? So that is an important thing with electromagnetism. That's the foundation of electromagnetism, that once current is moving in a wire, that current flow produces a, or induces a magnetic field, right? So the magnetic field around just a straight wire is normally in a circular pattern right so we know that the direction so it's going around the wire in a circular pattern right now the problem is how do we know the direction in which the the magnetic field is going right so that's where we use or importantly or right hand grip rule So a right hand grip rule gives us the direction of your magnetic field in a current carrying wire, right? So the right hand grip rule is very simple because we, it's basically us, this is the wire and we're holding the wire with our thumb showing the direction in which the current is going, all right? So in this case, this is the wire, current is going up, all right? So if we grip the wire, that's why it's called the right hand grip rule. We grip the wire with our hand, with our thumb pointing up. We notice these four fingers are going in that direction, right? So our magnetic field lines will be going in a anti-clockwise motion, right? So it's going in an anti-clockwise motion there, as shown by the the diagram, right? So we notice that the field line, the field, the magnetic field direction would be dependent solely on your direction of your current. So if the current was going down, then it would change direction to now go in a clockwise manner, right? But what if we had a magnet placed here, right? If we had a magnet placed there, to know the direction in which the magnet will deflect, right, is that we notice that the arrows are pointing in towards the magnet here, and if we extend these arrows up here, they are going away there, right? So that shows that this is the south part, and this is the, the north part, because the north always goes away, south always goes towards, right? So that means the magnet will have will be pointing 
in that direction to show that it's being attracted, the north of your the compass is being attracted to the south of your magnetic field. So anywhere on this, right, your, your compass will always seek to point to the south part of your magnetic field. All right? Now, let's look at a situation where these, this straight wire is now wrapped around in a cylindrical motion, right, to give you more than one turn, right? And once that is done, it is called a solenoid. So a solenoid is just a long wire that is wrapped around to, to resemble a spring, right? So we have basically a spring, but the wires are very compact, right, side by side, right? And they are connected, it's, if this is now, these two free wires are connected to a, a battery supply, right? And it allows current to flow in this direction, right? How can we find a magnetic field? Now, the same process, we use the right hand grip rule. So we have current, right? It's going up on this side. So if we grip, grip rule, so in this case, the current is going up, right? So we grip. The, the wire here, right? So current is going up. So we grip the wire. So we get it. The magnetic field is going into, is curling into inwards right here, right? And then if we, on this side, if we go out, right? So let's do it over here. So if it's coming down, right, then we grip. Right? So it shows that our fingers are going out, right? So in this case, our fingers will be pointing outward. So the magnetic field around a solenoid resembles that of a a bar magnet, right? So it goes around the solenoid like just like a bar magnet, and that's actually the mechanism in which we're used to make electromagnets, right? So all we do is to take the metal, put it inside the solenoid, allow current, a high current to pass through it, right? Over a period of time, that metal now becomes magnetized, right? And if we take out that metal, because this is going in, this part of the, the side of the metal becomes the south pole, this side becomes the, the north pole. Right? So that's how we create electromagnets, right? So we put the metal inside a solenoid, allow current to flow. So the strength of that metal or that magnet would be dependent on the, the number of turns in your solenoid, the current, the value of the current that is present, and also the type of material that is being used. Right? So that's how the, the solenoid will actually work in terms of getting your direction of your magnetic field. So we remember we use the right hand grip rule once current is moving in a wire. All right, so let's look now at the induction of current by magnet. All right, so finally we're going to look at two rules, our Fleming's left hand and our Fleming's right hand rule. So let's go with the Fleming's left hand rule. So Fleming's left hand rule tells us that because we know between two magnets, right, we have a magnetic field, right? And then if we have a current carrying wire, right, once current is in the wire, we also have a magnetic field. So if we have those two magnetic fields, right, so we have the magnet magnetic field and the current magnetic field that actually comes to contact with each other, so they interfere with each other, then it's going to create a force, right? So it's going to actually create a force that's present on the wire that has the current, all right? So that's what Fleming's left-hand rule tells us. It tells us the direction in which the current, the, the force will be felt. So it's the direction of force on wire, right? Because the, magnetic, the magnets have their own magnetic fields, the wire with the current has its own magnetic field. So those two interactions of magnetic fields will produce a, a force, 
right? Now, the, the law or the rule is to hold your three first fingers, right, in 90 degrees to each other. So the thumb goes 90 degrees to your index finger, right? Your thumb goes 90 degrees to your middle finger, right? And your index finger and your middle finger makes a 90 degrees, right? So at any point, it looks like that, right? So it's basically put out, put out your index finger and your thumb and then point your middle finger outwards, all right? So we get that. So let's look at what each finger means. So one, your first finger, your index finger represents your, your field. Right? And your field is your magnetic field of your magnets. So magnetic field normally always move from north to south. So we always going to point your index finger from the direction of north to south. So your magnetic field lines go in that direction, north to south, right? And then your middle finger tells the direction of the current. So the wire has current, right? So we, if we put our hand like this, then it shows that current is going in this way, but current is going in that way. All right, so we put our hand like that, and then if we let go our thumb, it gives us the force, all right? So we let go our thumb, and we see that the force that's acting on this wire will be going down. So we have a downward force acting on this wire due to the magnetic field. Now, it's kind of complicated to be turning your hand like this, so you don't have to, right? Because we know that the, the field, current, thumb goes up. The only difference between this diagram, between these two, is that the current is going that way instead of this way. So automatically, if we're supposed to turn our hand that way, the thumb should be pointing down. So if you don't want to turn your, turn your hand, then because this is going opposite direction, then that means your thumb will be going opposite as well, meaning that it will be down. So you don't have to flip your hand to show it, right? But once you get this, then you know that if you flip your middle finger to go the direction of the current, your thumb also will be flipped to go to the opposite direction, all right? So that's what Fleming's left hand rule says, right? So now let's look at the Fleming's right hand rule. Now, the Fleming's right hand rule is used to now determine the direction of induced current. All right. So what this is saying is, if we just have a plane wire, there's no current. Right. If we have a plane wire and we have a magnet, if we move one of those either the magnet or the wire, if we move it fast enough, right, we'll be able to induce a current in our wire. All right? So in this case, Fleming's right hand rule, something have to move. Right? While in our left hand rule, there is no movement. So that's how you know which, which rule to use. If nothing is moving, meaning our wire or magnet is not moving, we use the left hand rule. If we have a magnet and a wire and one is moving, we use the right hand rule, right? And remember, its purpose is to determine the direction of the induced current, all right? So in this case, it's easy to move the, the, the wire, all right? Now, the movement of the wire is also important. So remember, our magnetic field of the wire of the ma the magnet is moving like that, right? So the movement has to be done so there the wire cuts those lines, right? So the wire should be able to to cut the 
the magnetic field lines. All right. So this is our magnet, right? Our magnet field lines are going in this way. So our field lines are this, right? And we have our, our wire here, right? If we're supposed to move our wire between the magnet that's parallel to the magnet, we're not going to cut any field lines, right? So the only movement would be that our field lines would be going, our wire should be going up or down, all right? So that's the only movement that will give us a cut in your field line. If it's going from north to south or south to north, there is no cutting of the field lines. So in order to cut, you would have to go up or down, all right? Now, it gets more technical because sometimes you can go up and down at an angle, right? And that angle tells us that the value is reduced. But to get the maximum induced current, we go perpendicular to the field lines, right? So the movement goes perpendicular to the field line, so the wire can cut the magnet field lines at 90 degrees, right? And also the speed of the movement will give increase the, the induced current, right? So it's the same process as holding your finger for the right hand rule, right? So now the thumb tells us, so the thumb here changes its role, so the thumb tells us the, the motion, right? So where, which direction the wire is going or the magnet is going? So let's say we're going to do the wire is moving up, right? So our thumb would point upwards, all right? And then our index finger gives the same thing as the left hand rule, which is your direction of your field. So our thumb is going up, index finger should be pointing from north side, remember, to south side, all right? So it goes like this. And therefore, if we release our middle finger, which shows the direction of your current, it gives you the the direction of your induced current, right? And if we do this, we see that our induced current will be pointing in this direction. And that is your induced current, I, right? And we'll just give it a common I, because this induced current is a very small current, right? So it's not a large current that is like in this situation. The induced current is short, Right? And we always use in the lab to show that there is an induced created, we use what is known. So a galvanometer can detect very small current flow. Right? So it's very sensitive, so it will trigger it left or right depending on the direction of your of your current that is induced. So if it's if it's going to the the left, then your galvanometer points to the left. If it's going to the right, the galvanometer points to the right. If it's, there's no current induced, then the galvanometer actually goes dead center, which shows that it's zero right there, right? So any current, it flips from zero. But if there's no current, and no current could be that you're moving the wire parallel to the magnetic field lines. So you do this as fast as you can, you'll get a zero current. But once you're going perpendicular to the magnetic field lines, then you start getting current. So when you go up, right, this is going to the left, so it will point to the left. And if you come down, it's going to actually shift over, right? So if you continue doing like this, the galvanometer will go back and forth like this, all right? So that's how you use the Fleming's left hand and the right hand rule, all right? So we're going to actually use this rule here to actually tell you how the DC motor works. And the DC motor is actually that little motor, especially in your fans, right? So your motor like in your fan that, that causes the blade to, sprit, to spin, how does it actually work on the basis of using the Fleming's left hand rule, all right? All right guys, so let's look at how the DC motor works, right? So with the DC motor, we have a magnet both a north and a south pole magnet and between the magnets we have a coil a conducting wire that is actually bent in a rectangular shape 
all right and because it's dc motor it's connected to a battery supply that produces direct current so direct current as we know means that the current moves only in one direction all right so with this what we're going to look at is one how does the motor spins and two what's the purpose of that slit right there in our ring all right so first we have the the magnets right so we have the north magnet on the north pole on the right side the south pole on the left side all right and then we go so to know the direction right we need to know the direction in which the current is moving so we know current the current that we look at is a positive so the flow of the positive charges which in this case will be moving from your left side of the coil to the right side of the coil so on the left side of the coil the current is going up all right and then it goes around and then come back in from the the right hand side of the coil so to know the direction that the force is that will be felt right we use our fleming's left hand rule so remember fleming's left hand rule states that our first finger tells us the direction of our magnetic field right so in this case it should always be pointing from where the north pole is to pointing toward the south pole so in this case it will be pointing to your left right now we're looking at the point on the left side of the coil and in that case the current is going up in that coil from that direction right so therefore our thumb determines the direction of the force being felt which would be an upward force going on that side and we notice there is a black arrow there showing that is an upward force and then on the next side of the coil right where current now we still have magnetic field going in the same direction but our current is coming towards you right so therefore your thumb points downwards so on the right hand side of the coil we see a down arrow showing that the current the force being felt will be going down so if we should see this rotating right we get a rotation in our clockwise motion all right now if you notice right when the coil passes the slit there is something that happens let me pause it right at that point where you see it actually within the slit and right there right so directly in the slit and that slit is called the commutator right so the commutator actually changes the direction of the current in the coil right because the current itself not able to change direction because it's direct current so it only can flow through one direction meaning it's only going to pass from the left side of the coil to the right side of the coil so without that slit right let's show you what will happen so without the slit this is the left side of the coil this is the right side right remember current is going in that way so my finger is showing the direction right so without the slit when the coil flips once right we need the current in this this direction to continuously rotate but on remember current on this side is going this way current on the small finger is going towards me right so when the coil flips once the current on the small finger still we go in this way all right so because now current is going opposite direction your coil will actually rotate back to where it's coming from so you would have this rotation repeatedly without the slit so the slit actually the commutator gives you a continuous rotation because it changes the direction of the current each time in the coil so it ca it causes any coil going on this side the left side current to be going up so it doesn't matter if the left if it flips like this it gives this side the current going up so it continuously gives you that continuous rotation all right so that's what happens at the at the point where the slit is right and we continuously see there is a rotation now we notice that this rotation is a slow rotation right in that this could be due to a lot of factors so let's examine those factors first all right so let's go with the the field the magnetic field or the force if we reduce that right and that means there's less magnetic lines it's a slight difference in your speed right what if we increase the field lines right 
it shows it shows a little bit faster movement all right now let's look at the battery supply if we're supposed to reduce the battery supply right we notice the lines from your force gets smaller right and if we increase our mark or current voltage from the battery right the car the force itself gets bigger and hence the motor will actually start moving a little bit faster what if instead of just one coil we had numerous coils there right so if we increase the amount of coils our force also increases and hence the motor works faster all right so those are three factors that affect the speed at which the motor works so the amount of coil that's present right the supply the voltage of the supply as well as the strength of your magnetic field all right so that's basically how the dc motor works right and the difference between a dc and an ac motor it operates the same without the dc without the ac having the commutator which is a split because ac tells us the current is able to flow in both directions so you don't need any structure on that motor to cause it to change direction because it does that by itself so the ac would not have a split in the ring right so therefore it cause it will give a continuous rotation right and we changed it from a battery supply to an ac supply so that's the difference between ac and dc right it doesn't have a commutator because it already changes its current um, periodically and it's the supply is not a dc supply but it's a ac supply all right guys so thank you very much for watching and hope you understand something today and see you guys next time